pointing out what probably most of you know already, that we spend roughly a third of our lives asleep as humans. So that's an awfully long time. And this is one of my favorite quotes about sleep. If we spend a third of our lives doing something, <laughs> it's probably likely to, to be useful for something. It's not just a waste of time, right? So and I hope, hope that you all agree with me on that. So the question is, what's going on in sleep? What do we use it for? And um, is the brain just switched off, or is something else, you know, is something happening in sleep? And it turns out, I'm sure you know this already, but the brain is not switched off during sleep. Um, it's very busy, and we tend to measure the activity, that busyness, using EEG, so that's electroencephalography. And um, the types of patterns that we get from doing this look like this. So, um, so, I don't want to go into a lot of detail here, but these are just examples of how, as we go from relaxed wakefulness into stage, so early sleep, and then deeper into slightly deeper sleep, and then very deep sleep, and then REM sleep, which I'm sure you've all heard about, so where your eyes move around and you have really emotional, scary dreams and things. The, the patterns of electrical activity that we have are very distinct for each of these stages, and actually that's how we can tell the difference, how we know which stage we're in. So no, as I said, I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but I just want to point out the brain isn't switched off. It's busy doing stuff, and it's stuff that we can measure, and we do measure, and it's all interesting. Okay, and it turns out that those four stages, sorry, five stages of sleep that I've just shown you, so stage one, stage two, stage three and four that make up slow sleep, and stage REM, you actually cycle through these in a very kind of structured way during the night. So if this is your hours of sleep, and these are your stages of sleep, then you start out stage one, stage two, stages three and four, and then REM sleep. The reason it looks like it's coming up is because the brain activity is actually more similar to wake. That's why it's coming up again. Every 90 minutes, and then you go through that cycle again and again. And as the night goes on, you get less and less of this really deep, slow wave sleep. Those were the high amplitude, slow oscillations showed you on the previous slide, and you get more and more REM. So the point of this slide is just to say, you know, not only is the brain busy doing stuff, but it's doing it in a very, very structured way, which together with the fact that we spend a third of our lives doing this, seems to suggest that it might be doing something important, right? So the question is, what is it doing that is important? Um, one idea is that what it's doing is restoration and repair, so just um, compensating for damage that's happened as the brain is busy doing stuff in the day, having some time when it's, it doesn't need to process incoming stimuli to put things back as they were um, and to restore the balance of different chemicals that have been completely used up. So that's one possible thing. Another possibility is um, just energy conservation. So um, this, is, this is a possibility that people debate a lot actually because it's not clear why you need so much structured brain activity what you're doing is just energy conservation. So I have to say, we as humans conserve only about 12% of energy by being asleep as compared to being restfully awake. But so there's some energy conservation. It doesn't explain why you need all this brain activity. But the one that I focus on, um, and, and my students Isabel and Tia, who are here somewhere, um, are focusing on in their PhDs, is memory consolidation. So this is the idea that one of the purposes of sleep is to um, process memories, process information that we've taken in in the day and do something with that. And um, this is actually just a cartoon that I like. <laughs> but, um, so what you can see here, <laughs> yeah, hopefully you can see, so Fred had wanted to buy the car he takes, the, buy the car the day he saw it, but his friends told him to sleep on it first, and hopefully you can see he's there sleeping on the car. And anecdotally, this should seem familiar to most people. So it's not, um, what the cartoon is saying is sometimes when you've got a hard decision to make, or something that seems to require a lot of integration, the best thing to do is actually sleep on it. And a day of wakefulness to think about it doesn't do quite the same thing. So hopefully that's anecdotally familiar to everyone. And this is part of the kind of process we're interested in. So we're interested in memories that actually get strengthened, but we're also interested in what's going on? Why should sleeping actually make this kind of decision easier? Is it sort of integrating information together a bit? 
I mean, some of the kinds of things that we think happen during sleep. Okay, so, but, um, I can't, if anecdotally that doesn't do anything for you, then maybe I can convince you with some data that sleep actually does something. And so I want to tell you about, very briefly, about some data we have on getting people to do a rhythmic tapping task. So we had a rhythm like... as much as we can, as efficiently as we can, 
Um, and so now that we know that our brains do this when we're asleep, can we control this somehow um, and get them to learn what we want them to learn instead of like, you know, what we had for breakfast or you know, what's on Friends or something, get them to actually learn about your PhD topic. And there's some evidence that we can. Um, so this is a really nice study that actually T has just been presenting today to the undergraduates. Where is she? Back somewhere. She could tell you all about this, but um, this is a really nice study that came out in science a few years ago. And what they did is they got people to do this learning task. So this is that memory game, you know, where you've got cards that are in pairs and they're in an array like this. And you flip one over and you've got to find the pair. So you've got to remember where all the cards are. So people played this game and, you know, they played it a bit till they learned where everything is. And then they got tested on how well they knew it. And the whole time they're playing it, they smelled the smell of roses. And it, it wasn't just because the experimenters, you know, wanted to make it pleasant for them. <laughs> They're not that altruistic, unfortunately. <laughs> not depressed. <laughs> um, but but um, it was because they wanted to manipulate this. They wanted to use the smell as a cue to reactivate specifically this memory during sleep later on. And so what they did, they put all these people to sleep. This is a hypnogram of the sleep. Remember I showed you in the beginning how the stages recur during the night and you get more slow wave sleep early on in the night and more REM, that's the black bits, later on. So one group was given the smell again before they slept. Another group was given the smell, and that's what's shown here, again while they were in slow wave sleep during the early part of the night. And then all the group, another group was given it in REM, you know, they had various control groups. Um, and then all the groups were retested again the next day. And so the question is, which group do you think improved more across that sleep period? Any ideas? Smallest. Yeah, that's why the picture's like this, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's exactly it. So if you just look where the red circle is first, these are the behavioral data on this. And this is um, comparing the performance on that car task between the group who was given the smell in wake before they slept and the group who was given it in slow wave sleep. And what you can see is giving that smell during slow wave sleep led to a dramatic um, advantage in memory the next day on this specific task. So it suggests, and by the way, they tested them on other tasks and it didn't help with those. Okay, so it suggests that you're triggering this replay process and that's strengthening up these memories. And um, I could tell you all about the fMRI, but I think I'm probably over time as well. So I'm gonna stop with another, probably my second favorite quote, which is this one. <laughs> okay, so any questions on that? Does this only been looked at in adults or is it like um, it's a great question, actually. So it has been looked at in children as well, and it is different. Um, but it's quite tricky to understand what's going on in children because their brains are changing so quickly. You know, the characteristics of their sleep is changing as well. And so it's people are looking at it, but the pattern isn't always that consistent. It seems like the consolidation that happens in sleep is not the same, but it changes as they grow, and so we haven't quite worked out you know, exactly how it's changing. Yeah, but it's, it's a really interesting question. Yeah. When you did your test the day after, how long can you keep your memory in your brain? So this is another really good question. Um, um, in the Tapping study, the rhythm study that I showed you, we did it the day after, but um, we have done, and other people have done, sort of follow-ups a week or even longer after, and it just depends what you're doing. So it seems like it lasts a long time. So there's one study where they compared people who were allowed to sleep or people who were sleep deprived right after they learned something, and they followed them up four years later, and there was still a difference. So, yeah, it seems like if you don't get that consolidation straight away, it really influences the whole trajectory of that memory over time. Yeah. I was just wondering if there were differences in 
like food sleep is in bad sleep is incentive and that frame rate and succession trading in terms of their performance in a task. Have you looked at that? Yeah, so fortunately there are differences which allows us to do correlations, which is really, you know, so we can, if we get people who have, we can do correlations where some of our participants have had more slow sleep, say, and some have had less, and we can see how the amount of slow sleep they get predicts the consolidation they get, for instance. And, um, um, and that's not just slow sleep, it's other things as well. So yeah, so it does predict, and it sort of teaches us a big lesson about how important it is to get a good, I mean, I know that I really work on, like, I don't have caffeine, I, you know, make sure my room is totally dark and all these things because I realise how important it is to get a good sleep. <laughs> yeah. Should I stop? Uh, sure.